Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Is can everybody hear me? All right. I guess I have to be a little closer. Sorry to interrupt your conversations. We're just going to get rolling now. All right. So, um, by the way, my name is Rhiannon. I'm just the host for the evening and uh, welcome to the November Vancouver Bioinformatics User Group session. And this is actually our last one of the season. So thank you all for coming. We will have more later on in the new year. And before we get too far along, if you haven't already, please silent your silence your phones. All right, and we're all good? Okay. So just a heads up that this event is being recorded. Um, if you have any concerns about having your voice recorded, um, just please uh, feel free to contact Will at the email that's provided there, dev at vanbug.org. Our schedule will be having these announcements and then we get to have our trainee talk followed by our featured talk. And then we get to finish off, well, those of you here in person get to finish off by having some food and drink in the hall. Thanks to all the Van Bug Organizing Committee members, including our faculty members, Dr. William Zhao, Dr. Amy Lee, Dr. Faraz Hash, and then all of the other volunteers who could be here in person and those who could not. For our upcoming events, we do have ones, um, the third Thursday of every month is continuing trend for this year in the same location, January 19th, February 16th, March 16th, and then the April 20th, we're planning to do a social. So might end up being somewhere else and might end up being a bit more of a special event, but more news to come on that later. Uh, you can keep up to date on events by subscribing to Van Bug announcements request at sfu.ca and unsubscribe using the same events. We also try to use that to advertise other events that are going on. If you have any speaker suggestions for next year, we're all about hearing that. Please feel free to go to the website, vanbug.org to send in your suggestions. Getting into our sponsors, we are sponsored by the Graduate Studies in Bioinformatics, uh, the joint UBC and SFU program. We are also sponsored by Genome BC, bioinformatics.ca, which have the Canadian bioinformatics workshops. And if any of you have been looking at that website for the last couple of years, you might have noticed an absence of workshops, but I can say that actually with pretty good confidence, next year they're coming back around. So I definitely recommend you keep an eye out for what's happening there. Also, thank you to Imagia Connexia Health, to Langara College, to Stem Cell Technologies, and to our hosts, St. Paul's Hospital, Providence Healthcare. Van Bug is also affiliated with the International Society for Computational Biology, Montreal Bug, and Toronto Bug. For our featured talk, we have Dr. Emma Griffiths. She is the Ontology Project Coordinator, Lead Curator, and Research Associate at the Center for Infectious Disease Genomics and One Health also known as CIDGO, at Simon Fraser University. She's going to be talking about the CIDGO Public Health Pathogen Genomics Contextual Data Framework, how to cross the streams without the world imploding. But before that, we get to have a trainee, a member of the Bioinformatics Joint UBC SFU program, Faiza Keshavaras. She is a graduate student in the Dr. Steve, in Dr. Stephen Jones' lab, and she is a member of University of British Columbia. She will be talking about investigating cellular, cellular pathway modifications in cancer based on transcriptomic data using machine learning approaches. And you can come up. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Rhiannon. So as she mentioned, my name is Faiza and I'm a PhD candidate in Dr. Uh, Jones' lab. Today I will be talking about investigating cellular pathway modifications in cancer based on transcriptomic data using machine learning approaches. 
So as you all know, uh, different types of variations can occur in our DNA molecules, and uh, these variations can be um, events such as single nucleotide variations, small insertions and deletions, and uh, they can lead to production of abnormal protein or no proteins at all. And uh, since these changes can affect cellular pathways and can lead to uh, uncontrollable cellular proliferation, uh, or cancer, it is important to detect these types of uh, variations to find the most appropriate treatments for um, patients with cancer. So to detect these uh, genomic variations, the technique that is being used is called genomic profiling that uh, is being used to find single nucleotide variations, uh, small insertions and deletions, structural variations, copy number changes, and uh, it has been shown that they can lead to identification of tumor, tumor vulnerabilities and can guide clinical decision making and um, eventually uh, improve patients, patient outcomes. So although genomic profiling is a very powerful tool, it has some limitations. For example, um, only a subset of tumors contain actionable genomic alterations. Different patients with the same genomic lesion may respond differently to therapy because there are no two identical tumors. Uh, a high proportion of mutations are not even transcribed as RNA, and this proportion can be greater than 50% in tumors with high mutational load. And finally, genomic data is typically not sufficient to capture associations between alterations in different genes and pathways. So uh, because of those limitations, it is important to investigate other types of molecules in cells, such as RNA molecules and proteins. And uh, for that reason, my project is mainly focused on the set of all RNA molecules in cells uh, that is also known as transcriptome. So the RNA molecules can be quantified using RNA sequencing, and after some processing, we will end up with an expression matrix with uh, samples in rows, genes in columns, and expression values in each uh, cell of such matrix matrices. And what is the significance of transcriptomic data? So transcriptomic data can help us um, capture some of the crosstalk between pathways and feedback mechanisms in the complex cellular network. It will help us identify driver mutations, uh, detect aberrant splicing patterns, and gene fusions. It has also been shown that in a group of patients with metastatic disease, um, expression data alone could inform therapy more than any other type of genomic um, source and uh, addition of expression data to other source of genomic data increased the number of therapies that was available to patients and uh, so it of course like had some clinical benefits for um, patients with cancer. So the goal of this project is to find uh, transcriptional patterns or signatures that are found in cancerous cells that, re that, are, that results from genetic alterations and the results from this project will help identify active and druggable pathways in cancer and distinguish patients who can benefit from different targeted therapies. So the first gene I started to work on is uh, the TP53 gene that encodes P53 protein, which is a conserved transcription factor. It is known as the guardian of the genome due to its roles in tumor suppression, and it is the most commonly mutated gene in cancer. Uh, regarding the data sets that I use uh, in this project, they come from two main sources. The first one is the Cancer Genome Atlas, or the TCGA. The expression matrix that I downloaded from TCGA contains TPM values, has 9,370 primary tumor samples, and more than 48,000 genes. And the samples is spent across 33 cancer types. So um, as you can see, I had to exclude some of the samples because we didn't have mutation data for them. And for the rest of the samples, I first divided them based on the mutational status of TP53 into vial type and mutant groups. And for the samples that contained a mutation in TP53, um, they were divided further based on the consequence of those mutations to impactful and non-impactful categories. So for the non-impactful category, um, I put the mutations of these types in, in this group. And the reason for that is that we either do not expect these changes to affect the produced protein, or it is hard to predict the consequence of mutation based on the ensemble database. As an example, if we have a silent mutation, we see the change at DNA and mRNA level, but then we do not expect to see the change at the amino acid or the protein level. Um, on the other hand, if we have a change, for example, in a five prime untranslated region, 
if that uh, change occurs in a regulatory region, it can affect expression, but uh, it is hard to predict the consequence of such mutation. And thus we decided to exclude these types of mutation from training the algorithm to increase the likelihood of the machine learning model learning from true pathogenic mutations. The second source of our data is the BC Cancer Personalized Oncogenomics, um, or POC, and the expression matrix here also contains TPM values. We have 570 um, metastatic tumor samples here, same number of genes as in TCGA. And again, similar to TCGA, I first divide the samples based on mutational status of TP53 gene, and then in the mutant group, I further divided the samples based on the consequence of mutations. So um, in our recently published work, we could show successfully that a random forest model can predict the mutational status of uh, TP53 successfully in both TCGA set of primary samples and POG set of metastatic samples. And when we merge these two samples, not only the algorithm can, can, the algorithm can still do pretty well, but also the number of uh, correctly predicted samples increased slightly. We also extracted the samples that significantly contributed to the P53 signature, and we observed that for majority of these genes, they have some known associations in literature. And for the ones that do not have a known associations, we believe that those associations haven't been discovered yet. Another analysis that we performed was to use the fully trained model to predict the, uh, to predict the mutational status of uh, samples with non-impactful mutations. And uh, interestingly, we observed that for those uh, samples that had a silent mutation, majority of them were categorized as mutant. So I investigated this further, and we observed that almost for all those samples, um, those mutations occurred at the end of an exon, and here the two bottom tracks are from two tumor samples with wild type P53. And uh, so since the P53 is wild type, we can see that the intron is spliced out correctly. But for the rest of these samples, the mutation exists at the end of the exon and the intron still exists in the mRNA. So of course the natural next step would be to uh, expand the, these source of analysis to other genes. And uh, I performed some initial analysis, and what I'm showing you here is the performance of the random forest model. So this is the F1 score versus the uh, rate of mutant to wild type samples. So there are some important uh, points in this graph. For example, um, as you recall, I told you that uh, TP53 is the most frequently mutated gene in cancer, and uh, um, overall the rate of mutation for TP53 is about one third. And here we can see like for the next gene, the rate of mutation is almost half of TP53. And of course, for the rest of these genes, this rate uh, is much smaller. So it is important to use some um, class imbalance techniques to make sure that the performance of the algorithm is not significantly affected by uh, the lower number of mutations for these genes in overall. And uh, another um, important interesting thing to observe is that for some genes like BRAF or APC, although the number of mutant samples is much smaller than wild type, we can see that the algorithm still performs really well. But again, another important uh, thing here to note is that most of the samples with mutations in these genes come from specific cancer types. For example, it is known that the sample that uh, colorectal cancers usually have a mutation in APC gene, and thus we need to make sure that the algorithm is not just learning to predict a specific cancer type, and it is actually learning something about the function of a gene of interest. So I guess to uh, sum up, um, the, for in terms of the things that I'm planning to do, um, I am planning to use uh, methods such as uh, undersampling and oversampling to address the class imbalance issue. I'm planning to investigate the transcriptional signature of genes that are specifically mutated in one cancer type, and also to classify tumors based on mutations in combinations of gene, genes of interest. And uh, thank you for listening. Exclude um, the mutant samples where the mutation uh, effect is unknown. Um, does that improve model performance? Uh, well, um, it does. 
because if we don't exclude them, it means that some of those um, mutations might affect the function of the gene of interest and uh, like eventually the cellular pathway, but some, the, some don't. So if we have like a mixture of these um, samples but different consequence of mutations, then the algorithm cannot really learn what is um, related to the function of the gene that we're studying. So with those results, those were included, right? Where did you have them? For the, this one? Yeah. So uh, these are when we train the algorithm only with um, samples with wild type TP53 or samples with impactful mutations. Oh, okay. We excluded the non-impactful ones and then we predicted then their consequences that. here. Like yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, yeah. okay, I'm here for oh, this thing? I'm up here. So, when it goes red, mm -hmm. the white part. The white part. Sorry, this. this. That goes red? Oh, there you go. I'm old, so I don't understand technology. So, um, I, you know, they say, you know, when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So what I'm wondering is, is your mutation types here, um, I mean, so your work is, is, was fantastic, but I'm wondering if your classification standardized terms or whether you made up that vocabulary. Uh, you mean like for impactful or not impactful oh, or just the... So like synonymous, silent variant, downstream gene variant. No, these, these, these are just a standardized term that these are the terms that are basically generated by the um, algorithms that use um, like databases that are for mutation. So like Vivi didn't come up with these terms. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> so, Question. Uh, do you have any uh, idea why it performed better on the TCGA over the Uh One big factor is, of course, the number of uh, samples that we have. So, like in TCGA, um, after excluding the samples that didn't have mutation data, we still ended up with about like 87, 55 samples. But for POG, we only have 570. So that's a big factor. And um, another thing is that usually, like generally speaking, it is harder to predict the behavior in metastatic samples. But again, it's like we can't really tell this right now in this analysis because the number of samples is really different. But and it makes like a big difference, of course. So that, of course, can be like a very big factor. Yeah, it makes sense. And then also, you said you use random forest, right? Yes. Uh, why random forest? Did you try to um, well, um, I didn't exclude it, the one graph here because like this was a short presentation, but uh, I tried like a few algorithms and uh, they overall, they performed really similarly, but uh, random first kind of beat them a little bit, like um, performed a little bit better than the rest of them. Also in terms of timing, it was much faster. So a little bit better, much faster, and we just decided to go with random first. Seems like we are all questioned out. Thank you for listening. Okay, so was it this one? Also, I'll just mention right now, if you guys have questions, you're welcome to kind of ask them as we go through, or you can hold your questions till the end. Right. Okay. So first of all, I have to say, this is my first um, like live in-person presentation since before the pandemic. So I have to ask, can everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Okay. Um, all right, so thank you so much to the organizers for asking me to come and speak today. I'm really excited to be able to tell you a little bit about our work um, to do with harmonizing and integrating building data standards for data integration um, during the pandemic and beyond. 
Um, I would be remiss if I didn't begin the presentation by first saying that the work that I'm going to be presenting today was actually carried out by a whole team of people. I'm lucky enough to be here to be representing the team, but um, the we, there was a whole um, collection of people that worked very hard to make it all happen. So thank you to the team. Okay, so as we were discussing before, uh, before the, the talks began at the Center for Infectious Disease Genomics and One Health, we have uh, two different foci of research. The first is sequence analysis and tool development, uh, and the second is data standards and ontology development for data integration and harmonization uh, for public health and food safety. Um, and in the title of my talk, I likened data, likened data integration um, to crossing the streams from the 1980s smash hit Ghostbusters um, for two reasons. One, because it can be technically challenging. Um, and the second reason is because when you're trying to combine data from different sources, um, especially when those sources are different organizations, it can be a little bit politically exciting, let's just say. Um, and so it can feel very much like the world may be imploding, um, like, like in Ghostbusters. Um, we'll dive into that a little bit later, um, and hopefully you'll see um, what I'm talking about. So um, in the talk today, what we're going to discuss is we're going to start off with a, an out, a brief overview of the challenges of integrating public health genomics contextual data from different data streams. We'll review the importance of data standards and tools to operationalize uh, these resources, specifically the Kankagen specification and a tool called the Data Harmonizer. Um, I'll describe how we are expanding the Kankagen work um, to create a uh, contextual data framework for collaborative genomic surveillance. Um, we will then get to some of the political challenges of pathogen genomics data sharing, and then we'll wrap things up with a summary. Okay, so first of all, the challenges of harmonizing and integrating public health pathogen genomics contextual data. Okay, so um, everyone here is a bioinformatician, so it will come as no surprise to you when, we, when I say that the genetic material from pathogens can be extracted, sequenced, and used to understand sources of infection and to track transmission. Um, and what may be a little bit more surprising to you, although maybe not because we'll mentioned it before the talk today, um, prior to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, public health labs use pathogen sequencing largely for research purposes, with some exceptions, for example, PulseNet, um, which is a molecular um, surveillance network uh, for foodborne pathogens. But that, that was before the, the, the pandemic, PulseNet was largely transitioning from PFGE to, to genomics. Um, and so sequencing was not routinely used or operationalized. It was mainly used for retrospective analyses. But the pandemic really changed the public health genomics landscape. The genomics really was one of the heroes of the pandemic. And it was used for tracking transmission of outbreaks locally and globally, for identifying variants of concern. Um, the genomics data, of course, was used for developing clinical tests and vaccines and for un understanding viral origins and evolution. And as we were discussing before, it really was the pandemic that was the impetus for an enormous growth in public health genomics uh, and bioinformatics capacity in Canada, mainly fueled by uh, a funding injection from Genome Canada, and critically, a signal from the federal government that genomic surveillance was going to be a critical part of our pandemic response. And so um, the, the Canadian COVID-19 Genomics Network, otherwise known as Cancogen, was born um, with the the purpose of increasing situational awareness. So we know how the virus is getting into Canada, how it's moving, uh, how it's, um, it, it's um, infecting different populations in different communities in the country, um, as well as to inform, as I mentioned, our, uh, our pandemic response. Um, and the idea behind Cancogen was really the creation of a network of public health, academic, clinical, and industry labs that would all be um, accessing samples, sequencing, and bringing the data together so that we had a picture of uh, what was happening in Canada. 
Now, when we talk about contextual data, when we talk about genomics, actually, we are, of course, talking about the sequence data, but we are also talking about what we call contextual data. Um, and contextual data is all of the sample metadata, the clinical and epidemiological data, the lab results, and the methods information that we absolutely need for interpreting the sequence data. The contextual data provides the context for the trends that we see in the sequencing data. And when we have good contextual data along with the sequence data, we can do a lot of powerful things. So for example, we can characterize lineages, sequence types, and clusters. We can identify variants with clinical significance. We can correlate genomics trends with different kinds of outcomes and risk factors. We can monitor um, uh, what's happening in the lab and get an idea of quality control. We can compare results between laboratories and critically, we can generate hypotheses about sources of infection and transmission. And all in all, um, contextual data is absolutely critical for informing decision-making for public health responses and for monitoring the effects of different interventions. So in public health emergencies, you absolutely have to get the right information to the right people, and you need to do this quickly. Now, the thing is, is that data comes from different sources. It comes from different labs. It comes from different departments within the same organizations. It comes from different organizations. It comes from different databases. Now, data needs to be shared in a lot of different ways in an emergency. Um, it needs to be shared within organizations. In, and when you do sharing within an organization, you're probably uh, allowed to share quite a bit of information. Um, you may need to share with trusted partners outside of your organization. And so the amount of information that you can share with them is probably a little bit less. You also need to share with public repositories and international agencies. And so the amount of data that you can share with them is usually even less. The other complicating factor is that everyone uses different systems and different processes. They collect different types of information. They store and encode it in lots of different ways. So um, Will was one of the, the leadership core that helped to devise the Cancogen initiative right from the start. And so our lab was involved from the beginning. Um, and there was an awareness that because samples and contextual data was being collected at frontline labs, um, all over the country, um, specifically in different provinces. And as we discussed before, that province that uh, healthcare is under provincial jurisdiction. Um, the information that was being collected at those labs in those different provinces probably would not be the same because of differences in provincial public health priorities. Um, also, as, as we just mentioned, people are collecting information in different ways and storing it in different places with different formats. Also, the sequencing is being also done by different labs and different services. Um, but somehow we needed to bring all of that data together into a national database hosted by the Public Health Agency of Canada for national surveillance priorities and for coordinating a national SARS-CoV-2 response. And so um, we knew in advance that because we had so many different data streams, that data heterogeneity was really probably going to complicate and slow down analyses, and that something would need to be done about that. So when I say data heterogeneity, what does that really look like? What do I really mean by that? Um, the, what, how I would explain it right off the bat would be uh, everybody uses different fields to capture their information. So you can see uh, two different brackets on the slide here. In the top bracket, the, I should say all of the fields that you see in the slide here represent actual um, public health genomics data, uh, real data. Um, and so in the top bracket, you can see several different field names. But if you were to look at the values that go into those different fields, you would see that every, what everyone is collecting is sample type information. Now, in the bottom bracket, you see the word source. And that looks the same as the word source in the upper bracket. But if you were to look at the values that were going into the, into the field that that lab was using the word source for, you would see what, what that lab actually was talking about is the name of the submitting lab. Right, so the source of the data. So in the top bracket, what we're seeing is different labels, different fields, but they mean the same thing. 
Um, in the bottom bracket, what we're seeing is the same words, but they're being used in different ways. Now, people can take a look at the data and probably be able to tell the difference and, and understand how the data should fit together, but a computer can't unless you tell it how. So different fields um, is one uh, source of data heterogeneity. The values that go into those fields are another extremely large source of heterogeneity. Um, and because, as we just mentioned, information can be encoded in different ways. Some organizations have data dictionaries, and that's great. Others have uh, encode their information using free text. And when that happens, uh, you end up with a whole slew of, of data heterogeneity issues. Uh, you end up with errors in shorthand. You end up with differences in granularity um, in terms of uh, how much information, the specificity of the information that people write down. Um, you have people that use jargon. And so different words mean different things to different folks in different uh, domains. And so you end up with uh, semantic ambiguity. People use all kinds of different formats. And as we already mentioned, people uh, are asking and collecting information, different kinds of information. And that makes all of the different data sets very difficult to fit together. And as we mentioned uh, prior to the talk, um, data cleanup can take hours, it can take days, it can take weeks, and you can't afford that kind of time in, a, in an emergency. And it's all very um, time consuming and resource intensive. And so it's, it's not, not great. Um, another issue is that the variability in private databases tends to propagate out to public repositories. Uh, that also complicates data integration and analyses on a wider scale. And this is exemplified by the two different NCBI biosample records um, that all about both describe genomic SARS-CoV-2 sequences, but they use completely different biosample checklists. And so being able to put that data together would be very difficult. Um, you know, this is only two samples, but if you're trying to do this for thousands, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, or even more, you can understand that the, the problem starts to get exponentially more difficult as you go. So basically the moral of the story is we know from biochemistry that molecular structure impacts molecular function, same thing in data science. Um, the way data is organized and structured affects the way you understand and the way you can use it. So there are solutions to some of these challenges. Um, you can implement data standards um, at the beginning of genomics projects and initiatives. This provides many advantages. Uh, for example, the data becomes more interpretable in, and um, actionable by humans and computers. Um, when you have standardized data sets, this really opens the door for the development of a much broader range of tools that you can use on the data. Um, it also sets expectations, right? People, people don't sit there and, and say, okay, how are we going to you know, capture this information? It, when there's a data standard, they already know. Um, and this helps to harmonize information across labs and data sets and creates interoperability. Critically, it also helps future-proof the contextual data. So genomics, you can use it over and over again to answer different kinds of questions and perform different kinds of analyses. Um, by future-proofing your contextual data, this it's basically helping to enrich your digital assets, right? So that you can use it over and over again. Um, I don't know how many times I've seen a spreadsheet someone's created, and then a year or two later, we come back to it. They want to pass the project off to somebody else, and they can't remember what, how they were entering information into the spreadsheet or what things meant. Um, and so that, you know, that really degrades the value of the information. Um, using data standards is also, it helps you to fair, make your data fair. Um, and that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, making your data fair is part of data management best practices. So we knew right from the get-go that we were going to need a data standard, not just a data standard, but we were going to need tools to operationalize the data standard, as well as curation processes um, for making sure that people are using the tools correctly to enable harmonization and analysis of uh, COVID-19 genomics data um, throughout the course of the pandemic. So, um, you know, the, the, when anybody starts uh, a genomics, a pathogen genomics sequencing initiative, people always ask themselves very similar types of questions. So, you know, what, what should we be collecting? What should the minimal set of contextual data be? Um, and in the public health space, 
um, the, the types of epi and clinical information is usually um, collected using organization specific, what we call case report forms. Um, and these can be created by different kinds of authoritative sources. They can be uh, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada, it can be provincial public health labs, but it also can be the WHO or it can be other international organizations. So, you know, what, who's, whose case report form should we be using? Um, how should the information be structured? There are some data specifications, data standards that already exist that are out there. Um, and of course, there are different kinds of public repository requirements that, of course, are not harmonized. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we knew that they, there were standards that already existed. But when we look at them, we see that they were not specific for SARS-CoV-2. A lot of times data standards try to be as pathogen agnostic as possible, as generic as possible, so that they can be applied to many different um, initiatives and different pathogens. Um, but there are nuances to SARS-CoV-2 that are missing when you use a generic um, data standard. Um, they also weren't really designed for public health. Um, a lot of times the existing standards were really meant for um, hospital records. So there'd be very specific questions in there about like your, your BMI or your, you know, your height or your blood ox or something like that. And that's not really useful when you're just trying to figure out where a pathogen is and how it's moving around. That's too specific. Um, also, other data standards are meant for research and they anticipate that you can share a lot of different kinds of information that in a public health space you, you can't really share. So we knew that we needed something a bit more fit for purpose. And so, you know, we started to explore what something like that might look like. So our first question was, what should we be putting into this data specification? And um, as so we needed to do a bit of an assessment about the data needs. So what were people collecting that might be available to be shared? And then what were the kinds of analyses that people were doing? And what kinds of information would you need to be able to do those analyses? Um, and so to do that assessment, um, we started with uh, basic data collection tools, and those were the case report forms, which I've already said are the questionnaires used in public health investigations and surveillance activities, and they capture epi and lab data regarding uh, an ill person or a suspected case of any particular pathogen. And as I've already mentioned, uh, those case report forms differ between different Canadian jurisdictions. So what we did to perform the analysis was to collect all of the case report forms from all of the different provincial public health labs, as well as the, um, the national reference lab um, between March and April, the end of April of 2020. That's right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and we performed a field by field analysis of the different categories of information that, was, that were being collected, the terminology that was used, the structure and the format. Um, that were used and uh, the different levels of granularity of information that was being collected. Now, I'm not going to tell you the results. I'm just going to tell you that um, we have a paper that was released as a preprint um, and it's online and we're, we're working to get that peer reviewed right now. Um, I'm not going to tell you that because I don't really have time and because uh, there are spoilers in there uh, when I and you'll you'll hear all about it when I tell you what was in the data specification in just a just a minute. OK, so being in the data standards business, I get sent this cartoon pretty regularly um, and it stings because it's true. And so what ends up happening is that there are existing data standards, um, but any time anybody tries to apply them to a new use case, they're not quite right. And then somebody makes something new on their own. And so you end up with a uh, kind of a needless proliferation of not interoperable standards. Um, and so this is something that we wanted to avoid. So could we reuse any of those things that I've just mentioned um, when we are structuring um, our information? So there's a lot of different um, kinds of standards and specifications out there. Some I've already mentioned, um, some are in this list. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, I did wanna mention though, that we were able to use a lot of, well, uh, <laughs> some fields from these different uh, uh, standards um, to, to sort of create uh, to, to, for standardizing fields. But when it came to the values that go into these fields, most of these 
um, standards don't really provide that information. Um, but a really great source of uh, values to go into these fields um, come from what, what we uh, what, what are known as obo foundry ontologies. So we were talking a little bit about this before uh, the talk today. Um, and basically ontologies are a way of structuring information that aim to uh, represent reality. So philosophically speaking, they are uh, ways of understanding reality and they're meant to be as universal as possible. But um, in a data management sense, um, they're basically a set of controlled or standardized vocabulary in a particular domain. Um, all of the terminology is arranged in a hierarchy. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of that in the, the mock beer ontology that's on the right hand side of the slide. Um, really significantly, all of the vocabulary in the hierarchy is linked by different kinds of logical relationships. And those logical relationships can be, you know, pretty simple, like the is a relationship that you can see in the, the picture here. So a uh, lager is a type of light beer and a light beer is a type of beer. But you can start to link information in more complicated ways. Um, by using different kinds of relationships, like the has ingredient. You can link um, beer to different qualities or different producers by simply by using these different relationships. Also in ontologies, all of the terms are given a specific definition and the meanings of all of the definitions are disambiguated using universal identifiers. So for example, if you wanted to disambiguate a Corona beer from Corona around the sun, you could do that using identifiers. Um, you also, ontologies incorporate synonyms, um, and so, you know, an organization can keep using, if their um, synonyms, their, their preferred terminology is mapped to, into an ontology, they can keep using their preferred term terminology, and a computer will know, um, will, will know um, that it means the same thing as someone else's preferred synonym. Um, so this fits, facilitates mapping and interoperability. So um, when we were designing our, spe our Kankagen specification, we lent hard on um, uh, one particular uh, ontology called the Genomic Epidemiology Ontology, or GenEpio. Um, and this is an ontology that was developed by our lab. Um, and it was created with the goal of being able to integrate genomics lab clinical and epi data critical for whole genome sequencing based microbial pathogen investigations. That's a mouthful. So basically in GenEpio, it contains over uh, 5,200 terms for describing samples, uh, contexts of collection, instruments, analyses, and so on. Um, this is open source. Um, and importantly, uh, the ontology is indexed in different kinds of lookup services and registries. So the vocabulary is available to lots of different kinds of users. So, um, what, you know, oftentimes we'll talk to people about using ontologies. And, uh, you know, people will say, oh, it sounds like a good idea, but it sounds like a heavy lift to be able to implement these things in our system. So really, what's the point? Like, what, what do we really get out of it? Um, and as we sort of alluded to already, it really does help to make your data fair. Um, you, you're using um, a vocabulary or a semantic resource that, like I just said, uh, is more findable. They're in lookup services, they're in registries. They're not just in a GitHub repository somewhere tucked away where no one's gonna find it. Um, and it's not a situation where everybody's making up their own vocabulary. So then you have to go in after the fact and harmonize it, which is what we have to do right now. And it takes a lot of time and it's very complicated for all the reasons that we've already discussed. Um, and because these resources are findable and available, um, they can be used prospectively for standardizing um, contextual data at the beginning of a sequencing initiative, instead of, like we just said, retrospectively having to go back and harmonize. Ontologies are also living languages. So as uptake grows, as people are using the ontologies, it helps us to spot where the gaps are um, and it helps us build up um, vocabulary and logic in those gaps. So you really have that communication between the community and users and the developers. Um, and so, you know, you as a user can reap the benefits of an ontology, but you can also give back to the community by contributing vocabulary and logic. So it really is a two-way street. 
Um, and also using ontologies better helps um, prepare your data for more complex querying and machine learning um, and all sorts of other types of fancy analysis that you can't do if you don't use an ontology. So just to exemplify this, just to dig into the, the, the why ontologies are powerful tools a little bit more, um, I just wanted to give you a bit of a specific example. So in the center of the picture that you see here is the food ontology. Um, this is also another ontology that our group has developed. And what you can see is a web of resources and users um, for standardized food vocabulary. Standardized food vocabulary is really important in a lot of different domains of research, but also just in, in different kinds of life activities. So for example, if you're wanting to describe nutrients and chemicals in food, you need to be able to standardize the way you talk about food. If you wanna talk about agricultural production and, and the end products of that production, you wanna be able to standardize the way you talk about food. If you wanna talk about health and where pathogens are, um, in a food system. You want to be able to talk about it, food in a standardized way. Um, creating recipes, regulatory uh, processes. You want to be able to talk about food um, in a standardized way. And what you can see is the arrows actually are going back and forth. Um, and that's because Foodon has over 28,000 um, terms uh, to describe food, food products, feed, and different kinds of food processing, so cooking, preserving, all the, these kinds of things. Um, and Foodon actually takes in terms from other ontologies, and it also provides terms to other ontologies. So there's a bit of like a reciprocal um, um, processes that are happening. And this is because these ontologies are all designed in an, in, are in, in an interoperable way. So um, just digging down just one more layer deeper, um, we can also start to build um, knowledge graphs when ontologies, when domain ontologies are interoperable. So one example um, would be um, nutrient measurements in food samples. So if you look at the slide here, we can see that in the CDNO, this is a nutrition ontology, um, you're actually getting measurements of um, of uh, a nutrient from the phenotype, PADO, from the phenotype ontology. Um, you're getting uh, the concentration of a, particularly, a particular dietary requirement from uh, terms that were developed for the nutrition ontology. Um, you're talking about, uh, yeah, so your selenium from the, from the nutrition ontology. But if you look over on the right in Foodon, you're getting plant names from the plant ontology, you're getting plant species from the NCBI taxonomy, those are all in Foodon. And you can start to create graph database expressions by using different um, terms from the nutrition ontology and from the, the food ontology. Um, and so, like I said, you can start to build, build webs of knowledge and make a lot, of, a lot more connections between knowledge um, that you couldn't have done if you didn't use an ontology. Now, um, these ontologies are not interoperable by, or not, they are, interoper op they are interoperable, not by chance. <laughs> Interoperability has to be engineered. It doesn't just happen. You can create an ontology any way you want for any specific project, but that doesn't mean it's going to be interoperable with anybody else's ontology. And so um, the OBO foundry, or the Open Biological and Biomedical Ontology Foundry, um, is a community of scientists that are committed to building interoperable ontologies using the same principles and practices. And so they have been sort of unprecedented in creating consensus and a community of practice in the ontology building community. So Foodon and Genepio that we've already talked about, they are part of the Obo Foundry. Um, but another ontology that you may have heard of in um, in your bioinformatics studies is the gene ontology. And that's the kind of the flagship ontology of the Obo Foundry. And the interoperability of these different on, ontologies is really built on uh, common architecture. So people are grouping things together in the same way. They're created, they're using the same relations. Um, they they uh, promote the reuse of terms. So like we've just seen in the slide before, um, if you have vocabulary in one ontology, and you need it in another ontology, you don't create your own term, you reuse the ones that already exist. 
um, and that helps to create the interoperability. There's also in the Obo Foundry, there's also some uh, uh, <laughs> some oversight. Um, they, they just make sure things like IDs don't clash um, and that everybody is kind of, you know, doing everything the same way. It's open source and all of these ontologies are encoded using OWL, which is the web ontology language, which uh, relies on RDF and XML syntax. Okay, so that was a bit of a departure, um, but I thought it was important to talk about ontologies because we leaned on them so heavily in creating the Kankagen specification. So let's get back to how we standardize uh, SARS-CoV-2 contextual data. So uh, what is in the contextual data specification? Um, there's over 100 fields that uh, are, and are enable the capture of lots of different kinds of information um, from repository accession numbers and identifiers uh, to sample collection and processing, lots of different kinds of host information, sequencing methods, bioinformatics methods, um, and other types of uh, clinical testing, and then also who's collecting the samples, who's sequencing it, provenance information so that you can get, you can recognize all of the different contributions from different labs um, in the generation of those sequences. So they, like I said, there's over a hundred fields um, and we use 24 different ontologies to standardize those fields as well as over a thousand terms. Um, so the, the fields and the terms, um, there's a collection of uh, a, th a thousand um, descriptors altogether. Uh, sourced from those on ontologies. And a number of those terms were actually uh, developed by us during the, the development of the specification and um, um, added to existing ontologies. So really helping to um, build resources for the community as well as for our uh, specific project. Now, I said there was 100 fields. You don't have to fill in all of that information for every single sample. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had uh, data sharing agreements where only 15 were actually required. Um, and uh, during, over the course of the pandemic, there were, you know, the data needs evolved. And so we were, in, we were able to make, uh, you know, up at 33 fields required. Now, I was saying um, you... You know, you can create a data standard, but you really have to create a tool to operationalize it in order for it to be effective. You can't just hand someone an OWL file and then say, please give us information in this format. Um, and so we created a tool called the Data Harmonizer. Um, this is a tool for data entry, curation, validation, and transformation. Um, it's a spreadsheet style text editor application. Um, it has color coding to prioritize those required fields. They're in yellow. You can see them in the picture here. We have recommended fields. Those are in purple. And we have all the other fields, which you can use, but you don't have to. And those are all in white. Um, we also have a lot of different kinds of curation features. So you can sh you know, show, if you're a user, you can just see the required fields um, or you can see the full set. You can populate an entire column with the same information so you don't have to enter it over and over again. Lots of different kinds of curation features like that. Um, we also have uh, some validation, so uh, you can make sure that people aren't um, entering, you know, they're not, there, there are no errors, that they were filling in all the required fields using the right formats. Um, but critically, we also provide guidance. Um, so if you double click on the headers, um, uh, a little information box will pop up and give you the definition, some examples of what's expected in that field. So when people are filling in the information, they're taking information from their systems and transforming it into the data specification. They know exactly what they have to do and what's required. So um, the data harmonizer, um, instances of the data harmonizer were shared with all of the provincial public health labs. Uh, that, we're that we're collecting samples, sequencing, and submitting to the national database. Um, yep. So there's a question in chat from Angela. She asks, how do you weigh the relative ethical obligations to provide timely public data access to the minimum metadata, metadata sequence, completion date, place of sampling, with access to comprehensive and ontology-informed metadata? And then she adds, it's kind of a, it looks like a second question or comment. BC has improved its data sharing for SARS-CoV-2, COVID-2, um, but early data in Canada was highly delayed and made it very challenging for researchers outside of the generating labs to analyze sequence data. Is it better to release imperfect data expediently and update it? 
So this is where things get a little bit incendiary. This is where we're crossing the streams a little bit. So uh, this is an excellent question. So what are the, the question is, what are the ethical obligations of uh, releasing, you know, not perfect data and then correcting it later and getting it to researchers out in the public space? Um, and so uh, that was that obviously was uh, critical. Um, it was not because of the quality of the contextual data that was holding up the um, uh, holding up submissions. Um, you know, this the answer to this is is a multifactorial answer, right? So uh, public health labs were. I, I am not. I don't work in a public health lab, right? So I. I cannot necessarily answer for them. I'm going to give you my understanding of what happened. Um, and you're right, there was criticism at the beginning of the pandemic about um, the sort of delay in getting data out to the public repositories. Um, you know, the public health labs, they had a certain number of staff. And those staff were all, you know, involved in sequencing were often pulled off to help do diagnostic testing. That was the priority. Um, and so there, there were a lot of people, people in the public health labs were working nights, weekends, working overtime um, and working as hard as they could to get the data out. But there were, there are priorities, right? And the first priority is providing services and diet and, and telling people if they're sick or not. And then just below that is, is sequencing and getting that sequencing information out. Um, and, and being able to share that information with, you know, uh, ministries of health so that they could make decisions. Um, and getting the data out to the public repositories was, you know, obviously a high priority, but it was a high priority and in, in a big list of other high priorities. So um, at the beginning, as I mentioned, of the pandemic, we, there was an agreed upon set of fields that basically established when and where the, the pathogen was. Um, a number, part of that specification were things like age and gender and sample type as well. Um, but that was the agreed upon set of uh, fields and everyone did their best to provide that information and get it out as fast as they could. Um, but as, as we'll talk about later, you, you know, uh, there's transparency, but that needs to be balanced against other uh, public health criteria like data privacy and data security. So anyway, um, I hope that sort of answered your question. Um, but we will return to this topic. Um, I know we're, we're running over time, so I want to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, but thank you for that question. It's very important. So um, probably the one of the most exciting features of the data harmonizer is its ability to transform information. Um, the data harmonizer is not a place where the data is kept. It's a place where the data moves through on its way out somewhere else. Um, and as we've mentioned, there's a lot of different destinations for the data. There are different repositories that all have their own um, their own um, submission requirements. Um, and so if you had to reformat your own data for these different repositories yourself, it would take a horrendous amount of time. Um, and so one of the things that the data harmonizer does is it enables you to um, enter your information once and then you can click a button and format it for any, any uh, desired destination. Again, it's open source. Um, we're in the process of um, getting that published, um, but we do encourage people to take a look and give it a try. Um, so I know people here are a little bit more technical, and so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the data harmonizer under the hood. Um, basically, it's a browser-based app, and it works on pretty much any of the browsers that are out there that are widely used. Um, it, it operates, uh, it offers a library of different templates. So the one that we're talking about right now is for the Canadian specification for SARS-CoV-2, but the data harmonizer is being used for other data harmonization projects. And so there are other project and pathogen specific templates that are also available in the library that the data harmonizer can offer. Um, the data harmonizer, um, you, can, you can download it and use it uh, offline, use it locally. Um, and so it's, it's a secure application. You don't have to share your data with any online third party services. And that very much appeal to uh, the public health labs. Um, for template management, all of our vocabulary is managed in super fancy Google Sheets. 
Um, but we do annotate um, all of the different fields. They are called slots and all of the values are called enums. And this is according to a markup language called LinkML that's designed for the reuse of different schemas. Um, there's certain Python code that converts the, um, the information in the Google Sheets into a YAML file. Um, you can also do this by using a package called Schema Sheets. Um, and then there is specific whole, uh, code to implement the scheme in the rest of the, the code for the application. Um, and uh, the, the, the grid itself where information can be entered that is uh, generated based on a software package called Hansen Table. Okay, so um, the data specification was used across Canada, um, but it was also used in other places. And it was also, the specification was also reused for other pathogens as well. So who else is using the specification? Um, the spec was taken up by uh, uh, an organization called the Public Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology, otherwise known as PHAGE. This is a Gates Foundation funded volunteer organization of uh, bi uh, bioinformaticians, clinicians, researchers um, from all over the world, 90 different organizations. Uh, really with the goal of improving the reproducibility, interoperability, portability, and capacity for public health bioinformatics globally. Um, the, we have a lot of, so full disclosure, I'm part of the um, part of phage. We have a lot of specific um, goals, and those are all on the right-hand side of the slide. I'm not going to go into those. Um, but we aim to do our work through uh, five different working groups, one of which is the Data Structures Working Group. And that's the group that really um, helped to internationalize the specification so that it could be used in different labs. Um, if you are interested in learning more about phage, uh, I put up some contact information there. Um, we're always looking for um, enthusiastic people. Um, and so the internationalized version of the specification, either parts or whole, were taken up by SPHERES, so that's basically the cancogen of the U.S., by NCBI, by the Latin American Genomics Network, different labs in Africa, as well as OzTraca, which is a genome exchange platform in Australia. What I don't have in the slide here are different pilot projects in different other African and Asian labs um, around the world that are currently underway. Okay, so I told you that the specification was also repurposed for other pathogens. So what was what's the deal with that? So as you probably know, on July 23rd, 2022, the World Health Organization declared that monkeypox was a public health emergency of international concern. And um, the monkeypox is an orthopox virus. So this is the same family of viruses that cause, that cause smallpox. And so there's a vaccine available. Um, but monkeypox causes uh, rashes, these are le called lesions, uh, fever, swollen lymph nodes, body aches, but it's rarely fatal, even though it has been implicated in some fatalities in some cases. So as monkeypox was you know, increasingly on the radar of, uh, of the, the national and provincial public health organizations, in Canada, we knew that there would be a need for genomic surveillance of monkeypox. And so um, to facilitate this, our team was able to rapidly develop a template in the data harmonizer for monkeypox, leaning heavily on the work that we'd already done for SARS-CoV-2. So being able to reuse the same fields and maybe just tweaking the pick lists. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of the kinds of harmonization that we, that we are able to do, um, with the specification in the data harmonizer, we were able to harmonize variable clinical sample descriptions. So you can see on the left, these are real um, sample descriptions. Um, from the Public Health Agency of Canada, you can see that the, you know, there's different spellings. There's, a, there's French in there as well. Lots of different sample types. Um, and biomaterials that were being um, extracted. We were also able to harmonize different kinds of specimen processing. So a lot of times people will pool samples, you know, swab different body parts. Um, and so we were able to standardize the way people um, encode that information as well as sequential sampling. So if you sample somebody and then you sample the same person in the same spot uh, two weeks later to see the progression of their case, um, we were able to structure information so that um, it was uh, reproducible um, as well. 
And critically, we're also able to structure One Health monkeypox samples. So um, testing monkeypox uh, for monkeypox in wastewater or other types of hosts like uh, rodents, um, also fomites, so inanimate objects, surfaces where people might be picking up the virus, we were able to structure that information as well. And um, if you are interested in taking a look, um, there's a lot of great examples of standardized contextual data at NCBI in our Canadian bio project. Uh, it's the, the uh, bio project accession is there. I think at one point we were the third highest contributor of monkeypox sequences um, during the, the monkeypox epidemic. Okay, so we were able to quickly create the template for monkeypox um, in a reduced amount of time. Um, which required a and it required a reduced amount of workload and reduced the amount of uncertainty as to what should go in it and how how the information should be structured because we were able to reuse fields and terms that increased interoperability and of course standardization and along with reusing the fields and terms we were also able to recycle expectations agreements skills tools and processes as well as training materials. So, um, you know, the specification, we, are, we obviously used it during the pandemic and also for the monkeypox epidemic. What I didn't tell you, and I don't have time to really go into today, was that alongside the SARS-CoV-2 specification, a parallel specification was being developed for understanding antimicrobial resistance in the Canadian food supply uh, with a, through a One Health lens. So uh, we really, we're able to reuse the core parts of the specification, not just for SARS-CoV-2 and monkeypox, but also for AMR and for foodborne pathogens. And we're currently looking at um, harmonizing um, the, the clinical specification with uh, another data standard that, has, that is being used for wastewater um, to be able to combine data streams about SARS-CoV-2 from the clinical and wastewater um, um, environments perspectives. So really the goal going forward, because we have trialed this specification by fire so many times, is to be able to articulate you know, what fields can be used for any pathogen under any circumstances, which pick lists that we need to update in a hurry, and really re to, to make this specification into a framework for collaborative genomic surveillance uh, under any circumstances. Um, now that's easy to say. We also have to, um, you know, be able to accommodate metagenomics information and different kinds of um, time and space variables, and we're working on that right now. But this is really part of pandemic preparedness in the future and oper operationalizing data exchange in public health. Okay, so just really, really quickly, this is where we're getting into the crossing the streams. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, that health is under provincial jurisdiction. So it's really the provinces and the territories that dictate what information gets collected and what gets shared. Now, the thing is, is that there is a patchwork of federal, provincial and provincial legislation, as well as different institutional policies um, about data sharing, and they are all poorly adapted to genomics. So really, um, in terms of the rules for data sharing, genomics data sharing, it really is a bit of a wild west. And there are competing interests when deciding on what can be shared. Um, a lot of times uh, data stewards <laughs> don't wanna release too much information because they're concerned that they will get flack for it. Um, sometimes data can be misinterpreted. Um, if you have a journalist going into a public repository and saying what should be happening in schools based on the, the data that's in a database, which could be highly biased because of what's being sequenced and what's being sampled. You know, that causes a lot of headaches for public health labs that need to be kind of <laughs> being the voice of reason and kind of maintaining control over the messaging so that it's not super confusing for the public. Um, and so because of uh, all of these concerns, you know, uh, data stewards can sometimes be a little bit risk averse. They err on the side of caution when it comes to sharing data. And the, the public, uh, the, the provincial and territorial agencies, they are the data stewards. And, um, you know, in public health, pu uh, public trust is absolutely crucial. If you lose trust, people won't get tested. They won't respect restrictions. They won't seek treatment. And so, um, you know, trust is a bit of a double-edged sword though, because, um, you know, as this data stewards, 
protecting privacy is a, is a very big concern. But if you're not transparent and you don't share data, um, then the public can, can be suspicious as well. Um, and so, you know, it, this reflects exactly the question that, that got asked earlier. Um, friction is created when stakeholders involved in genomic surveillance don't understand each other. And those stakeholders can be the public, it can be public health organizations, it can be academia, industry, and so on. Um, and so because of all of these, um, because of all of these factors, you need to have agreements and you have to negotiate the release of pretty much every single basic data element. So data sharing is interesting. Um, some challenges are technical, and, I, and <laughs> I think a lot of people would agree that those are easier to solve than the challenges that are political, um, and those are much more difficult to solve. And so um, our data harmonization team has also been involved in different ethical, legal, social, and logistics projects um, to better articulate where the blockages are and um, you know what, what the data what data sharing challenges in Canada are. Um, we performed a national survey across Canada to be able to assess Canadians' comfort level with sharing different types of data so that we can actually have data in hand to say, no, the public expects this kind of data to be shared. So, you know, we should be sharing that information. Um, and then we also have another project called the Data Flow Project, and this involves interviewing public health practitioners in Canada as well as globally, all about how the data moves from the front lines through public health agencies and beyond. So really interrogating the different kinds of systems, regulations, and gatekeeping that happens. Um, we have another project, I won't mention that right now, that's about um, linking data between um, academia and public health data streams. Um, but uh, I'll just sort of... <laughs> summarize the, the conversation about data sharing by um, listing the challenges that still need to be addressed. Um, so right now, data sharing policies are too vague. They are open to interpretation and every single organization has to reinterpret the rules. Um, and this creates a burden on those organizations, but it also creates a barrier to sharing for all of the reasons that I mentioned previously. Um, also, data is insufficiently annotated with, method, with methods. So, you know, if people are worried about misinterpretation of data, we really need to be including more information about sample strategies, testing criteria, and so on, so people can understand the biases in the databases. Um, there is a big fragmentation of systems, and there's a lack of interoperability across the board. Um, there's, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Um, also, one of the big concerns is that there were a number of barriers that were actually removed during the pandemic by different kinds of emergency acts. When we return to normal, which is basically now, those emergency acts go away and we go back to um, a number of challenges that existed even before the pandemic. So if we think it was bad during the pandemic, it was even worse before. Um, what we really need is, uh, well, what we lack is, uh, is low friction bridges between public health and academia. So I think that kind of pertains to the question that was asked as well. Um, there are a lot of issues like data attribution, intellectual property. Um, you know, public health are the data providers, but they want to be seen as partners and not just, they're not just making data for someone else to go and take and uh, make big discoveries. They want to be part of that process and be involved. Um, and then also the lack of right, the right contextual data, data management tools. That's also an issue. Um, all right, so just to wrap things up in the future, uh, where are we going with these uh, standards and tools? Uh, where we have a number of different separate tools to do different kinds of things. You got exposed to one of them today called the Data Harmonizer. Uh, we have other tools, one that's called LexMapper that can take free text data and map it to standardized tools uh, terms. We also have another tool called Gene that enables people to search. It's sort of like um, an Amazon of ontologies. It allows you to shop it has a shopping cart and you can pick and choose uh, different fields and terms and create your own ontology based specifications. So um, these are all really great standalone tools, but people always say, I don't have time to learn all of these things. Can you just make one integrated workflow so I can go from start to finish? So that's that's um, our next next steps in terms of um, evolving these tools. Um, we also have a partnership with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, to create that framework for collaborative genomic surveillance. And we, of course, want to publish all of the things. 
so everybody can read about them and know that they exist. So in summary, I know I'm stand between you and the pizza. Um, I want to wrap this up. Um, so in summary, we have learned that contextual data is critical for making sense of sequence data. Uh, we have discussed how harmoni harmonization across data sources is complicated by uh, differences in meaning as well as structure. Data standards help streamline um, the structure and the use of data. Um, it, they also help to future-proof the data and to make it fair. Um, ontologies and mapping facilitate interoperability and help reduce the workload of data sharing. Um, open source ontology-based specifications like the Kankagen spec uh, were used to harmonize public health SARS-CoV-2 contextual data during the pandemic for national public health priorities. Uh, the data harmonizer was used to um, implement the specification and to harmonize the contextual data. Um, a framework for collaborative genomic surveillance is being developed as part of public health preparedness for current and emerging pathogens. And work is desperately needed to facilitate data sharing in Canada beyond technical development. So in the area of policy, ethics, and so on. Okay, so that was a lot of information. I really, really appreciate you listening um, and not completely falling asleep while I was talking. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to thank everyone in the SIDGO lab um, and I, as well our public health partners and, and our funders and our uh, other international organizations that uh, helped with this work. Um, so thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Yes. Right. So that is an absolutely fabulous question. And um, when we were doing our data flow project, these are the kinds of uh, things that we were trying to get at. And one of the um, uh, phenomena that we discovered is that um, a lot of times data sharing and data access, it, it's based on relationships, right? So what can get shared depend between, say, departments in an organization or between organization really depends on if you have someone who can access it and someone who knows how to do the sharing. And they also know somebody who's high up that can give them permission to do it. So it's not just data sharing agreements or systems. It's also relationships and people in, in different places that really facilitate uh, data sharing. So. In terms of giving specific examples, I, 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 <laughs> I, I don't think I'm comfortable naming names um, and discussing those specifics, um, just because a lot of the conversations that we had were confidential. <laughs> um, but I mean, some uh, we we didn't really interact at the hospital level with people. We interacted with uh, folks at the provincial public health lab. The provincial public health labs would be doing the interacting with the with the other labs. Um, and so that sort of tiered relationship was another factor because um, what the provincial public health labs got really depended on what was being collected and how fast the information was shared from those frontline labs like hospital and hospitals and clinics. So there were different stages of, of you know, data collection and different stages of, of how the data moved through the system. Um, so, um, that's kind of a wishy-washy way of answering your question. I just have to be careful about what I say. Um, yeah, right. Everyone's probably starving. Super, super over time. Yes. Um, in your in your experience. Uh, standardizing the the food ontology, the COVID ontology, everything. What was the most frustrating field or type of data to come up with a way to oh. have standardized language for? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, 
Um, probably. So we do have fields that talk about different lineages. And um, so that largely is free text because things like Pango are changing all the time. And you need to, uh, <laughs> you know, what the designation might be one day, it might be different the next day. And so providing a standardized list was really difficult for that. And so we <laughs> pretty much just let people put that in as free text and, and it did change a lot. So that was kind of tricky. Um, I guess maybe sample descriptions as well. I mean, we saw some variability in the slides there. Um, you know, people people de describe things at all different levels of granularity and there can be, depending on what the pathogen is, for, for SARS-CoV-2, it was generally like mesopharyngeal swabs. But for monkeypox, you had all sorts of things that were getting sampled, different kinds of lesions, different kinds of body parts. There's a lot of groins. Um, but yeah, and you know, again, French, um, sh yeah, abbreviations, all kinds of things. Um, sometimes very specific, like it was the right, you know, upper thigh kind of thing. And then someone else would just say leg. So being able to fit that information together was, was kind of tricky. Thanks for that. Yes. Uh, a question from Tony. Um, is genome GWAS, so genome-wide association studies, considered in the contextual data to see the peculiarities in different races? <laughs> um, so like involving ethnicity data? Is that what you're talking about? That would be my assumption. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so those, uh, so, so using ethnicity information um, is important to collect. Um, uh, we that was not really factored into our the contextual data that we were enabling the sharing of, um, because that is a very politically charged type of information. Um, some types of information, like whether someone identified as indigenous, um, that you no, you you. you that was not in the data sharing agreements. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so uh, in terms of, you know, GWAS, I mean, it's great to be able to do those studies. We weren't providing like that ethnicity data is, was being collected in, in different places, but is not being shared. Um, although there are very, you know, informative things that you need to look at with eth ethnicity data, but we didn't share that. I just want to add a comment because I was working on mm -hmm. this. We actually did initially start trying to work on that and work on contextualizing, but we're, we're basically asked to stop um, drawing a lot. Like you can think of HIV, for example, um, where people are worried or just or other minority groups um, of being targeted mm -hmm. or having hostile studies done from them with not, not them considered. And so when it comes to, say, people working with Indigenous data, they want to make sure Indigenous communities are involved and in the collection of that level, I guess that level. So yeah, when we're getting to such large scale projects, we're just not ready for it yet, I guess. Um, so when we were looking at the different kinds of data standards that were out there to, to describe ethnicity, they were, they were not good. They were not um, ethical or thoughtful, really. There were a lot of problems with the things that, that existed already. And as we looked at it more and more, we just thought, you know, we know this is important. And it's not that we, it wasn't shared because we couldn't structure it. It was that people weren't didn't want to share it. Um, but, you know, people's ethnicities can be multi multifactorial. You can have different ancestors from different places. And so um, it, it becomes, you, sometimes you need multiple fields and it gets complicated. And so we just didn't do it. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was wondering about um, basically translation. Oh, yeah. Because uh, not only are you using English vocabulary, um, it also seems to be based a lot on English grammar. Oh, I yeah. The huge problem is that like, Chinese is a very uh, textual language. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what your experience with that was. So uh, uh, we very shamefully, all of our specifications are only in English right now. Um, even our French speaking uh, public health partners would convert their French information into the English 
um, specification and we know that's not good at all. And so one of our next priorities is to at least be providing all our specifications in English and in French, as well as all the instructions for how to use the tools, right? Um, but in terms of branching out into other languages, you're right, semantics in different languages are uh, incredibly different. Um, and so this is why it's important to have consortia of people. It's not just having us do it, but having consortia of people that that are familiar with, uh, you know, different semantics to be able to make sure that, we're, that things are translated. You can't just do a Google Translate. So, um, yeah, it's important important to build up that network of people that can provide that expertise. So that is definitely something that needs to be done, and it is being doing being done with like food, um, sort of, <laughs> but uh, but not with the specifications that we talked about here. Yeah, like it's, uh... Sorry, if I can't mm -hmm. like, add to that. Yeah, because um, for example, with food on, um, we're using a lot of different foods from different cultures. So we do have those names, those names written in an English format um, and using um, the kind of common um, characters that you'd see here. But um, the OVO community in general does want to make it more accessible in different languages. And, in, and exactly because of the semantic issues that you run into with translating, they don't want to just have alternate labels or have alternate synonyms. They want to try to get people who are experts in those languages to help make alternative language versions of like different ontologies. Um, so that is something that is definitely a recognized issue in the community and seen as a big and high priority, but we're not there yet. So, I mean, I would just, I would add um, the, one of the interesting things when we were uh, creating the data harmonizer and deploying it, not just in Canada, but in, in other labs around the world. In fact, the Latin genomics uh, uh, network, there was uh, a public health lab in Argentina that actually started using the data harmonizer because all of the, they were having trouble submission, submitting data to GISAID. And it's because, uh, well, what they told us was that their uh, frontline workers were, there, they weren't that comfortable with English. And so it was hard, they couldn't troubleshoot. And so what they found very helpful was they could get their data into the data harmonizer and it would format the, the spreadsheet for upload and then it, then it would just go up, it would just upload. And so they were able to bypass all of those different issues that arose because they couldn't read the instructions and interpret and troubleshoot. Um, so it's one benefit, even though it wasn't in Spanish, but at least it, it overcame some cha language challenges. Okay, you guys must be starving. Okay, all right. Thanks everybody.